So there's no real exchange. I mean, there's an exchange. There's no real particular benefit on either side. But supposing Mr. Lee just gave me a goat, then I would have to thank him because I did not deserve the goat. I didn't work for the goat. I didn't do anything to get the goat, but he gave me the goat out of his goodness. And uh, that's the idea behind thankfulness. As a thankful and person... Get his goat. Huh? And you get his goat, too, at the same time. No, it's okay. Yes. That's an expression. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> it, works, it works out in all directions. It's like, I don't deserve it, and I'm acknowledging that I don't deserve it, and I'm thankful for it. And that's the idea behind thankfulness. That's good. Um, goats are more universal than we anticipate. Um, anyway, this uh, passage we saw in Psalms, this kind of is defined in the context of Christian living. What is thankfulness? And God reproves his people here. He basically tells them he doesn't need anything from them. And he goes on, you know, he lists all these things. He knows all the beasts of the field. He knows all the cattle of the air. He owns all the hills. He owns the whole world. God own, owns everything. So what does he really need from us as people? If God, God were hungry, he wouldn't tell us. He could take care of that far better himself. He doesn't have any sort of needs like we have. God doesn't need anything. He's all sufficient. He's all powerful. But what does he ask from us? He tells us this, Offer unto God thanksgiving. And um, this is what God wants from us, is us to be thankful to him for all he's done for us. And uh, this is what he tell, says, Pay thy vows unto the Most High. Now, back in the Old Testament time, they would have certain sacrifices they would be commanded to make. And interesting, I looked about uh, the off sacrifice of Thanksgiving. There was a specific Thanksgiving sacrifice. It wasn't an expensive sacrifice at all. Um, the uh, peace offering of Thanksgiving was, was just a... Um, was, uh, I think it was just a few little loaves of bread or something and maybe some other things, but it wasn't an expensive sacrifice at all to somebody. It was just uh, basically, and what they did is they offered that sacrifice, and then they and the priest partook of the sacrifice. The priest got to eat a little bit of it because the priests partook of the sacrifices. It was their way of being supported. And, um, and then the person ate the sacrifice himself. So he brought the Thanksgiving sacrifice to God, and he and his family would eat it. So, honestly, he wasn't benefiting God, if you will, by any way by it. It was his way of giving thanks to God. But what does this mean for us? Um, what does God have for us today? Well, the moment of salvation, God delivers a person from their sins, so that way they can live for Christ. And uh, this is what baptism is all about, is identifying on the outside what we have done on the inside. Um, when a person is saved, they're delivered from their sins and they're expecting eternity in heaven. And baptism is saying on the outside, I'm going to live for Christ. Christ has died for me. I am dead to the world in Christ and I am going to live for Christ. And uh, it's very important for a believer to be baptized and to live for Christ. What God calls on us to do is to be thankful to him and live for him instead of for ourselves. To live the life he's called us to live. And then the next verse says this, And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. God asks us to look to him for all our needs instead of to ourselves. God doesn't need us to do great tremendous works, to pile up heaps of gold in his treasuries for him. God asks us to live for him, to give us his, our hearts, to give him our hearts, and to trust him when we have problems. And then when he delivers us, to glorify him for delivering us. It's not a complicated life. It's a simple and joyful life. And it's exciting. And it comes from being thankful instead of ungrateful about what God has done for us. Um, thankful Christian living is acknowledging the good God has done for us. Is kind of a summary statement down here. And living for him as a result of that goodness without trying to pay him back or earn from him the gifts he offers. He offers all, he, he's given all things freely unto us, Romans chapter 8 says. And uh, they're all there for the asking and for the trusting. And uh, so we can't earn salvation, we can't work for it. But he'll give it to us if we ask. We can't earn the Holy Spirit, but if we'll, uh, we'll have the Holy Spirit's power if we live for Christ and uh, we ask for it. All these things God has for us, 
But they don't come by thinking God owes us something. They come by our being grateful and our being submitted to him. What does the Bible have to say about thankfulness? Uh, someone go ahead and read for me Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Can you get that for me, Lee? Today is Get Lee's Goat Day. <laughs> giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in, our, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, how frequently should we give thanks? Always. Um, for what range of things? Everything. everything. All things. Always everything. Um, God wants us to be thankful. And uh, the question we can ask ourselves then is, how do I be a thankful person? How can I work in me to have a thankfulness? Mindy, is Anthony still down there? Can you yell at him to come on up? Thank you. He missed the cue. Or wasn't given the cue, more probably. Um, uh, Psalm chapter 116, verses 12 through 13. Psalm 116... Um, The Bible says this in uh, Psalm 116, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? That's a good question to ask. What shall I render to God as is pay him back? How will I pay God back for all the good things he has done for me? And uh, so then we go on to read the, the next verse after that. It says this, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. What can a person do in response of thankfulness for God's great gift of salvation for him? Well, simply believe in Christ. Um, it's interesting, we read about unthankfulness in the book of Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 1 talks about how the people, when they knew God, glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They turned away from God, and uh, they were unthankful. Um, unthankfulness in the Bible is very much tied to rebellion. And uh, it's interesting, the reason, Jesus said, the reason people don't come to the light is because they don't want their deeds to be reproved. What's that mean? They don't want their deeds to be reproved. What's that mean? They want to live like they are and not be corrected for it. That's right. They want to do what they want to do. They don't want to be corrected. They don't want to be told they're wrong. They want to have their own way to heaven, not God's way. They want to do the things they want to do. They don't want to be corrected. And the person who will not be corrected is a rebel. Uh, this is kind of an extra. It's an aside. But it is very easy for people to be very subtle rebels. And we can find this in ourselves often if we will look carefully. So look carefully and see about are you allowing God to correct you? Um, when others correct you, what's the response? What is going on inside? And if you find this uh, rebellious, unteachable spirit in you, know that it's rebellion and you need to get rid of it. Unthankfulness um, sends people to hell all the time. They're not thankful for what God has done for them. They don't want to believe in Christ because they're not thankful for that great gift he did for them. Now, we cannot repay God for his goodness. We cannot earn his favor by good works. Some people think that, uh, that they're going to heaven because they got baptized. That's a good work. It can't buy heaven. Um, the sacrifices they could offer couldn't um, buy God's favor. Either in the Old Testament, he said, you know, he doesn't need them to offer all these sacrifices. What's that going to do for him? He already owns all those things anyway. Um, all... Um, a person can't get to heaven by joining the church. They can't give enough money to the poor to go to heaven. They can't. Um, some people think, well, they'll live a life of poverty. They'll sell all they own. They'll live in a monastery of some sort. They'll seek a simpler life. And perhaps God will uh, spare them because they did so many good works. It says this, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? You can't repay God for all his benefits. Um Good works are the result of thankfulness produced by salvation and surrender to God. 
Um, trying to do good works to earn salvation is putting the cart before the horse. You receive salvation, and then out of gratefulness to God, you do the things he calls you to do, not the other way around. You do those things because you're grateful and because you're rejoicing in him, not because you're trying to earn salvation. So what about thankfulness and humility? That's an interesting thought. Thankfulness and humility are very tied together, just like unthankfulness and pride are. Can someone go ahead and read for me 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verses 24 through 26? And uh, Katie, can you get that for me? Here we see a situation where King Hezekiah has been delivered from a uh, severe illness. And God tells him, you're going to have 15 more years to live. And uh, we see King Hezekiah's response here. Go ahead. In those days, Hezekiah was sick to death and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefits done unto him, for his heart was lifted up, therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. This is basically a summary. Hezekiah gets miraculously delivered. At some point after, he kind of gets a hard heart about it, and uh, he's angry at God, and... He lifts himself up in pride. Instead of being grateful, he's proud. And uh, the thing is, basically, I guess Hezekiah thought, well, I don't know exactly all of what he thought, but maybe he was upset at God for only giving him 15 more years, or maybe he thought somehow he deserved better. That's probably what he thought. I don't know all of what. But Hezekiah lifted himself up in pride, and pride is the opposite of thankfulness. Instead of... Uh, of what the benefit God had given unto him, how he viewed it is, is he was better than that. Instead of being thankful, he had this idea that he was better than that. And thankfulness basically it humbles the person who's giving thanks. It places him as unworthy of the gift and acknowledging the need for the gift. Instead of that, Hezekiah, this is kind of a uh, opposite passage. It kind of illustrates the opposite. Hezekiah basically has this thought of, well... He was better than what he the what he did received. He shouldn't have gotten what he got, and uh, he deserved better than that from God. And that's the idea: is he deserved better, and uh, he was upset. And that's really the, very much we find in unthankfulness is when we think, "Well, I deserve better than this. I shouldn't get this. I shouldn't be treated like this by God or by man." That we find is complaining, and that's unthankfulness. And when we have that unthankful heart. It turns away the blessing of God from us. We see here Hezekiah received wrath upon himself and upon Jerusalem. They humbled themselves, though, and they turned again back to God, but later they would be judged. Hezekiah's son, who would reign Manasseh, would be one of the most horrible kings of all time of Israel and Judah. And uh, probably this bitterness Hezekiah had in him passed down a little bit to Manasseh. And um, our unthankfulness does have ramifications in our children and in those who follow us. If we're not thankful, they will learn that unthankfulness and uh, they'll end up probably receiving a lot more of the problems from our unthankfulness than we'll receive. Hezekiah turned around, but I guess it was too late when he turned around to turn his son Manasseh back around. And Manasseh turned into a terrible wreck. Manasseh's life got so bad and he was such a wicked king that God delivered him into the hand of the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria sent him into exile for, uh, I don't know for how long, but um, the man destroyed his country. His country then had to be sent into captivity over and over again. It repeats in the Bible that the land would have to be judged because of the sins of King Manasseh and the sins of everybody they did following him. So unthankfulness has very, very bad results. Um, kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit in the lesson here but um, it's very important for us to develop in us this heart of thankfulness to God instead of complaining how can I live thankfully Psalm chapter 100 Psalm chapter 100 
The Bible says this, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, and it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. How can I be a thankful person? Well, be grateful for everything God has done for you. And, uh, yes? Psalm 97, 12. 97, 12. Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. That's a good summary verse for the passage. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's a very good cross-reference. And uh, you can go ahead and jot down in your Bible or in your notes next to that. And um, in my Bible, it's on the same page. It's helpful to have the short chapters in Psalms. But um, how can you be a thankful person? <clears throat> Praise God and thank Him for all things. Um, often people get this uh, attitude in them. They, uh, they read the one Bible passage that says, In everything give thanks. That's uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I think, verse 20. It's a good verse to learn for a Bible verse context. Contest because it's like four words. But the Bible says, in everything give thanks. So they'll get this idea that it says, well, it says, in everything give thanks, but I don't really have to be thankful for everything. The Bible says, giving thanks always for all things unto God. Um, that verse isn't just trying to say, well, you just try to endure the bad suffering and... Uh, Get, be thankful that God's been good to you at some point. It's, the Bible says all things work together for good. We're supposed to be thankful for everything, not just pick and choose and things we think are good, be thankful for them and develop a spirit of bitterness for things we don't like. Serve God with joyfulness of heart. It says, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. A Christian who can't sing... Uh, songs of praise is a uh, unhappy Christian and it's more than just sing them with your mouth sing them with your heart um, the songs of praise of the Lord it talks about how God gives us a song in the night even in the hardest times if we'll be a thankful person if we'll be happy God will give us a song and he'll give us some rejoicing Amen. Um, uh, serve the Lord with gladness come before his presence with thanksgiving goes on to say uh Acknowledge that God is good, and he's done good for you in all things. Um, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. The thankful person is a really happy person. Mm, uh, that's really all there is to it. If you're a thankful person, you'll be really, really happy. If you're not thankful, you'll be really unhappy. Um, it's amazing uh, how two people can go through the exact same situation, the exact same time, and be with each other, and either love it or hate it, depending on how thankful they are. Um, um, me and Eric and uh, Katie and Anthony, we went on an expedition to the Everglades the other day, and uh, Eric, his whole goal was to capture this, uh, like, two hours worth of pictures of the stars. And Eric captured his two hours worth of pictures of the stars. And he was extremely happy about it. He got bit a little bit by mosquitoes trying to capture it. Anyone ever been in the heart of the Everglades and bit by real Everglades mosquitoes? They're larger and they bite much harder than regular mosquitoes. It feels like needles. They're much more serious than regular ones. They're not really harmful. Um, the last documented case of malaria in Broward County was, I think, in 1908. Um, it's not a problem, really. It's, it's just pain, that's all. But Eric got bit a lot by mosquitoes, and he was happy because he got his time lapse. So he went back in the car, slapped a few more mosquitoes, went to sleep the rest of the time, and was unspeakably smug because he was thankful. Um, actually, all of us were happy the whole trip. Uh, but Anthony got bit by a few more mosquitoes, but he got to see this really neat bird called the spoonbill. It kind of wades around with its spoon-shaped mouth eating bugs and critters in the water. And it's a pretty rare bird, and most people never see one. It takes a lot usually to see them, but Anthony was unspeakably happy. Now, supposing I had been ungrateful for all the things we'd seen. What's that? 
Supposing I'd been along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Supposing someone had been there, they could have seen all those things and experienced all those things, and on, the only thing they'd have known what to do is, if they'd have been unthankful, is complain about we got bit by mosquitoes, we got, um, we were in the car and it was hot, and we were bored. You know, a person can, you see that when kids go to um, camp sometimes, they can easily complain about the, uh, the bus ride. They can complain about all kinds of things. Uh, I don't think we've ever really had much problem with kids complaining on our camping trips, though. Uh, like on our Bell Rice Ranch trip in the summer and things. Um, we work hard to teach the kids to be, try to be thankful, and we keep things exciting anyway. But people can be, um, go through the same thing, and it can be wonderful for one person, and that's because they're grateful. And it can be terrible for another person. It's because they're ungrateful. And uh, ungratefulness robs us of joy. And uh, I guess the final thing under here, how to live thankfully, never complain. And uh, there's kind of a little, uh, what you call a little, what, what, what was that word for the statement you had? It was like for the, the five statements. Anyway, there's one of those statements there. He had some kind of word describing him. It's one of those kind of statements. Anyway, thankfulness is acknowledging God's goodness to us and living joyfully for him because of that goodness. It's kind of a summary statement, if you will. What about unthankfulness? Well, we look at complaining here. Complaining is the opposite of thankfulness. Uh, there's, what's a great Bible synonym for complaining? Murmuring. Murmuring. I love that word, and it sounds fun when all, everybody says it together, too. Um, grumble, grumble. Grumbling, that's the next thing in the notes, or being gloomy, having this negative attitude. It's the opposite of thankfulness. And you can tell pretty easily if you're being thankful or if you're being unthankful just by your attitude and like what's, how you're responding to things. And uh, we're commanded never to complain. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 says do all things without murmuring and disputing and uh, it's interesting when we start murmuring it's real easy to start disputing what's disputing arguing, arguing fighting having strife um not getting along with others that's by the way that's our next week's lesson is unity in the, among the brethren um basically how to be a happy christian basically get along with the uh, brethren in christ get along with people that's next week's lesson though but we are commanded to never complain. Um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, do all things without murmuring. Can we do it? Well, God wouldn't have put the Bible, command in the Bible if we couldn't do it. God can enable us to be happy in everything if we'll just decide to be thankful instead of being ungrateful. And uh, ungratefulness exemplified. We have... Just uh, basically a few more passages here. We still have 15 minutes somehow. Um, Exodus chapter 16. This is one of the classic passages in the Bible about complaining. And it's easy to point at others in the Bible and see where they went wrong. I would say that we would pretty much do the same if we were in their spot. <clears throat> it says, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, um, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of Egypt. So they had just recently gotten out of Egypt. And it says, And the whole congregation of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Quick question, how enjoyable was Egypt for the children of Israel? It was slavery. bad. Slavery. Slavery is never good and not enjoyable at all. This was a pretty hard slavery. They were, uh, they were pretty miserable in Egypt, really, when you get down to it. And they cried out to God for the bitterness of their hard bondage. It was terrible what was going on with them. And uh, this is what it says. Verse 2, In the whole congregation of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So they're out in the wilderness, and they're upset at God because they don't have food. 
Well, in the last chapter, God had miraculously provided water. In one case, they, he led them to a bitter water, and he told Moses to throw the tree into it, and the water became sweet. And then he led them to this place of palm trees and water, like a bunch of oases, kind of a little group of them there. And they were taken care of miraculously. And they'd uh, just prior to that, they'd been delivered from the hand of Egypt. God sent ten great plagues to judge Egypt and spare Israel. He led them through the Red Sea, but smote uh, Pharaoh and drowned all his horsemen and Pharaoh and all of them. But they survived and they were taken on dry land and they were miraculously delivered. And here they are murmuring. They're complaining against God. And they're like, well, it was better back in Egypt. We had bread to the full. Not really, probably. We had the flesh pots. We had all these things. They had all this food back in Egypt. It's funny how somebody who's complaining sees things different than the way they really were. It's like God gives someone deliverance from something and then they get this complaining attitude like, well, things were better back before. They weren't really better back in Egypt, but the peop people get this complaining attitude. God's done all these things for them. And then they get this complaining attitude. It was better back in the other place. It was better back before. It was better back the other way. And God's done miraculously for them, but they're ungrateful. And uh, God basically in the next two verses tells them about how he's going to send the manna down and uh, um, basically jump down to verse 8 Moses said this shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat and the morning bread to the full for that the Lord heareth your murmurings which ye murmur against him and what are we your murmurings are not against us but against the Lord all complaining is ultimately against God we can complain about all kinds of things. And there's a difference between complaining and trying to fix a problem. It's not that people, if there is a problem, we'll look about this next week, about unity among the brethren. And going to your brother and trying to fix the problem. Complaining is when you're talking bad about something. Complaining is when you're talking bad in your heart. Complaining is when you're upset about something and you're not grateful about something. There's a difference between trying to fix a legitimate problem and having a complaining spirit and it's really clear when we all know when we're having a trying to fix a legitimate problem and we're having a complaining spirit um, mostly complaining is talking to somebody often who's not even associated with the problem they're not even really directly involved in the problem but we're talking to them anyway because we'd rather talk to them than try to fix the problem it's easier so we'd rather backbite and backstab that's complaining and uh, here you have these people they're upset at Moses and Aaron because God hasn't given them bread. God ends up giving them manna and he ends up sending them all these quails to eat. God raises up miraculously this um, whole bunch of quails which come. And uh, I guess quails are kind of a little bird. It's kind of like chicken essentially. Um, I guess this is where Baptists get their love of chicken. Um, basically chickens. Kind of different probably. But... Um, they're Middle Eastern quails, which are probably similar to chickens than our uh, New World quails are. So the chickens is a good enough working idea. They have all this food. God has taken care of them. We see later in this chapter, they still murmur. We see next chapter, they murmur. You look in the book of Numbers, they're still murmuring. You see all these, like, they have all this complaining attitude. And they complain about everything God has given them complaining has nothing to do really with what we've actually received it has everything to do with the heart with which we receive it they have all these things and they still complain they still murmur they're still upset even though god has delivered them and he miraculously provides for them later they even complain about the manna they're like well we keep on eating it and we don't we they complain about it and um we see that rebellion against God is the root of all murmuring. Psalm chapter 78 discusses the children of Israel in the desert. We looked at this briefly last week. Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verses 8 through 19. We won't read the whole passage. And might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God, and they refused to walk in his law. 
and forgot his works and wonders that he showed them. So God did all these wonders, but they forgot about them. The complaining spirit is characterized by forgetting benefits which have been done unto it. It talks about how God divided the sea, made them to pass through, how he was a a pillar of cloud by day, and how he was a pillar of fire by night, about how he gave them water in the wilderness, and... uh, they, this is what it says in verse 19. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Well, a God who's great enough to divide the Red Sea, who's great enough to uh, turn the waters to blood, to smite the cattle of the Egyptians, but not of the uh, Israelites. A God who's great enough to smite the firstborn of anybody who hasn't put the blood on the lentils of the door. God is great enough to do all these things, can easily provide a table in the wilderness, and he did. Even though they were ungrateful, God still provided for them. And it says you know, later in a different chapter, um, He gave them their request, but sent leanness to their souls. Their complaining destroyed them. Um, unthankfulness produces unhappiness, loss of blessing. It produces defeat. See, about there they, they turn back in the day of battle. It causes us loss of the Holy Spirit's power. A complaining Christian doesn't have God's power in him. It causes disunity among believers. Believers who complain sow seeds of problems. You want to get big problems in a church, you go ahead and complain and uh, complain about what Pastor Price does or what about someone who comes to the church does or something here and there. You start complaining and it sows problems in the church. It shows, sows dissension among brethren. Instead of everybody being all together, people are separate and they're divided and um, when, when people are separate and divided, there's not happiness, there's not joy, and there's defeat in the church. And the church is not able to perform its function. Um, speaking of animals, uh, instead of goats, I was thinking about um, uh, buffaloes in particular. Not buffaloes, um, it's musk, musk oxes. I've read about them. Um, musk oxes... <coughs> I don't know where they're from off the top of my head. I think they're from Asia or somewhere. But basically, what they do when they get attacked by things is they kind of form a ring of oxes. And they have their horns on the outside and the women and children in the middle. And all the big old musk oxes are in a big circle. And all the weak ones and sick ones are in the middle. And the wolves can't get at them. There's really bad wolves over in Russia. They're much fiercer than the ones over here. The bears can't get at them. Nothing can get at them. But if the cows, the musk oxes, they don't get along with... It's hard to say musk ox a lot. Oxen. Um, musk oxen, they don't get along. And they... Uh, that, that is the proper, proper plural. Yes. Um, they don't get along. They kind of spread out, and uh, they're very vulnerable to getting attacked and divided. And they're not effective at doing their job of being musk oxes, oxen. When we as believers don't get along, we're not effective. We're not together. We're not defending each other. Um, The believer who wants to be better at the church shouldn't blame the church when he has problems in his life. That's what people do, but they shouldn't. They're the one who decided to cause problems and uh, roam off from the group. Um, That's basically one of the number one rules of youth group on a teen activity is don't leave the group because that's when bad things happen to somebody. Um, uh, Don't have this grumbling, complaining spirit. Because grumbling and complaining causes disunity, and uh, it destroys the work of God. What's the solution to murmuring? Um, We see in, this is our final example. This is the people of God. They were complaining about God being their ruler, and they wanted a king. That's some pretty ultimate complaining to complain about God being your ruler and demand a human instead. But that's what they did. And um, basically... God gave them their request. And God warned them it would be really bad, but uh, and how he would raise taxes and how he would cause them all kinds of problems and he'd take their sons to fight in their army and he'd take their daughters to be his bakers and he'd take people to be his, his workers and his slaves and he'd take from among them and it'd be really rough on them having a king, but they wanted one anyway. <clears throat> so they got it. Anyway, this, they uh, Mos- or Samuel preaches to them a sermon in this chapter about their judgment for it, and they repent. And uh, this is what God tells them through Samuel. He says this, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, 
for consider how great things he hath done for you. Repent of the, un, of the rebellious spirit of the ungratefulness and then consider all the good things God has done for you and serve him uh, with all your heart. Serve him rejoicing, as he said. Uh, um, develop a teachable spirit. Uh, stop all the complaining and negativity. When you find yourself being complaining, when you find that negative spirit about something, just go ahead and stop it. Just go ahead and turn it off, cut it off immediately, just stop. Um, and instead, be thankful. Be thank happy and thankful in all situations, knowing that Christ, knowing the good Christ is doing. I worded that somewhat awkwardly, but... Um, Christ is doing good. And there's even a little happy smiley face at the bottom to remind you to be happy and thankful. God has good things prepared for you in the future and he is giving good things to you now. And um, there's no reason to be complaining or unthankful. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? It's interesting. Um, there's been a number of people who haven't come to this church because they were looking for a spouse elsewhere. They figured, well, if I come to this church, I won't be able to find a spouse ever. I came to this church, and God brought me a spouse out of nowhere. People say, well, how could you get a godly spouse in South Florida? There's all kinds of wicked people down there. Well, of course there are. They need to be led to Christ. God gave me one. Again, God furnished a table in the wilderness. Interestingly, I actually used that verse, and I was praying to God that I knew he could provide me one, even though I couldn't see a way. Well, God did provide one, and uh, God can provide anything and everything we need, and uh, all we have to do is just be thankful and let him work, and he'll take care of us. Where's the passage about leanness in one soul? Um, he sent them their request, but gave leanness in their souls. What is it? Psalm 106. Psalm 106. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And uh, I can look it up later for you, too, if you remind me. But... Uh, God has given to us all things richly to enjoy, the Bible says, and um, all we need to do is just rejoice in Him. Yes? And one last thing we remember about complaining is from a leadership perspective and how important it is uh, yeah, for a husband and for men in particular and for leadership in the church to lead in, in a joyful, grateful living. Uh, if, if a wife complains, a husband needs to stop it. Is to put an end to it and uh, just say, hey, that's complaining, that's murmuring. We need to be grateful. That's right. My wife has never complained about anything unless I'm complaining first. That's one of the things I've learned. I just never heard her be ungrateful for anything unless I'm a little bit gripey. And when I am, it gets in the house. And uh, our people in our church very rarely are ever complaining or critical about things unless I'm a little bit ungrateful about something. And uh, when we see that in someone else, it vexes me. When I when somebody gripes around me, I can't stand it. I'm a positive personality. I believe God can do great things. And when somebody starts talking about just down about things, or they're just down about it, it, it vexes me. It just irritates me. But the first thing I do is look at <laughs> my part in that. Where was I part of this? Where how did I bring this into it? I always have to remember that a grateful church has a grateful pastor. True. And a grateful wife has a grateful husband. And grateful children have grateful parents. And we, we have to remember that you know, we don't live in a vacuum. And our attitude in this is more important than just our happiness. It has everything to do with how we everything with how, to do with how we lead and help others. That's good. That's a good finishing line. I jotted it down for the next uh next what you call it, uh, version of it. Well, we'll go ahead and pray and uh, be dismissed from Sunday school, and uh, we'll be starting the morning services in just about 15 minutes. So, um, dear God, thank you for your goodness to us. Please be with us here in this morning service to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.